Hey guys, welcome to the Kung Fu Report podcast. Chris. Is that what we're calling it? Yeah, that's okay. what we're calling it, man. <laughs> All right. For continuity, okay. let's do this. Okay. okay, so today we have quite a few questions to cover. All right. Let's start with the one from Kiddis. Kiddis and Dale. Hey, Kiddis. I hope I'm saying your name right, but you know. All right. So the question is, does being in the present yeah. hamper your creativity? Because with creativity, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to let your mind wander, right? So not in the present. Ah, oh, okay. So, that's the question. <laughs> That's the question? Yeah. Um, being in the present, does it hamper my creativity? No. I, I personally don't think so. Um, I'll talk about it from a martial art point of view, and then I'll talk about it from a Qigong point of view, and maybe some of it will help you. I hope it does. Um, you suppose you let your mind wander. That is true. When your mind's wandering, you're definitely not in the present. So you're in the past projecting to the future, which is really good, like uh, free association type of writing or um, subconscious, just letting yourself write, especially if it's done with the music you like, especially classical music. A bunch of stuff will come out of your subconsciousness, right? Usually in story form, where once again, I talk about it a few episodes back, so I won't talk about it now, but a story will come out, and that story is a myth. Right, and the characters in the story will be an archetype. Together, you basically got this movie you're writing, and it's really about you from your subconscious. Right. But as you're writing, is in a third person, so you don't have to worry too much about it, right? So when your mind starts wondering, many things will come out. But if you want to narrow it down to something very, very effective, this is not the only way. But using story writing is really good for that. Then you decode the story. Then again, it's based on you, and then you can use mythology to help you to develop signposts for your life. That's a very, uh, very old technique, but also used in modern times and is very effective. So yeah, wondering, you're 100% right. Wondering is really good for creativity. But I do um, respectfully disagree that being in a present will hamper your um, creativity. For example, like when you're doing martial arts, we have, depending on a system you do, there's things you're supposed to do in a system and things you're not supposed to do. Rather, it's Kradi, Tai Chi, Bagua, Xing Yi, Wing Chun, Kali. Every system has its own borders. Very few systems are open-ended. So there's things you're supposed to do and things you're not supposed to do. But when you start going away from being the basics, where you're doing cooperative training, where you know what's coming, like uh, you do this, I do that, you do this, I do that. Then I get a chance to do thousands of repetition right. to program something, the sign lapses in my nervous system. That's the basics. So that would be cooperative training where everything is pre-scripted. And you have to go through that stage for classical conditioning, right? right? But once you have that dialed in, by that I mean you can do something with speed, accuracy, power, coordination, balance, and other physical attributes proper timing in the right angle without thinking. If you have to think about it, then it's not in your nervous system. It's still in your head. But once you do it so much that is in your body, you don't have to think about it anymore or second nature. Now it's time to pressure test it. And you go from light to medium to finally heavy. But there's a part that you can't cross or there will be heavy injuries. And so you need safety measures, of course, right? right. So when you start testing a lot, is now is not cooperative. During that stage, if you pay attention to the present, right, then there's a direct feedback loop. What you think and what you project it, what you assume will work, might not work as well as you think. What you presume that doesn't work sometimes will work. So what you want to do is you, if you test something over and over and over and over and over and over again, eventually there will be a common pattern that you can see, a trend. You start to see what works well and what doesn't. And that's a very unique thing. Everyone thinks usually it's universal. Some parts of it is, but a large part of it is unique. It's based on your um, natural inclination of movement, your body type, your personality. Um, basically, it's the unique you. So now you transcend system, and now you have turned into style. That's the difference between system and style. Right. Like if we're writing a language, we're both writing English, that would be the system. Right. But our handwriting is very uniquely different. Right. That would be style. And the way you write. Yeah. Like, yeah. So when you pay attention to the present moment, you get to transcend system and go into style. So you see how the creative process was based on the present. That's one example of how the present doesn't hamper your creativity. In fact, if done properly, it enhanced the crap out of it. So, yeah. When you, um, okay, so let, let me circle yeah. back a little bit, right? So you say, when you stay in the present, mm -hmm. 
you have to be present to be able to react to what's coming to you. Yeah. But where does the, I st I'm still kind of confused. Where does the creativity comes in? Like how you react is the creative part? Yeah, because you're present. So let's say if you do angle one over hand strike, I do right. technique A. If right. you went from diagonal on this angle attacking me, I do technique B. Right. And then on this angle, I do technique C. And then there's like, you know, a million of them. Right. So let's just stay with A, B, and C, right? right? As a brief example. For each one of those, I'll do 50,000 reps, roughly around there, right. where it's scripted and cooperative. Right. You attack this way only. I know what's going to happen before you do it. Right. And then that gives me a chance to work on a technique. First, I layered on coronation. Once I can do it with coronation, I do it with speed. If I can do it with coronation and speed, now I qualify to try it with power. If right. I can do it with speed and power, then I'm going to lay on more accuracy and angles and variation. Right. So I have about 50,000 reps. Usually most people, that's classical conditioning and psychology, I mean, neurology, Neuro yeah. sorry. And then it ends up being programmed into my nervous system, so I never have to think about it again. Once I got that, I'll do technique B. Same process, 50,000 reps. Right. Then technique C. So now I got A, B, and C. But it's all cooperative. But I needed to go through that stage before I'm qualified to pressure test. Just like if you're learning a musical instrument, you have to learn the basic notes before you can play a song, right? Right. But let's say I went through that stage. Maybe it took me a year, maybe it took me three years, depending on the person right. and how much time I have to train. Okay. Once I have that, I go, all right, Chris, now let's test this. Now don't tell me what's going to happen. You can do A, B, or C. So my mind automatically assumes when A happens, this will happen based on my conditioning. Right. Same with B, same as C. But what usually actually happens when I test it, when I don't know what's coming, when you're going full tilt at me is, whatever I do, it won't be textbook of what I conditioned before. Something unique will happen. I'll start to go, oh, actually A doesn't work that well. It works better if I kind of do this. Uh, B doesn't really work that well. It works better if I modify it like this. Right. Oh, C actually works really well. I, I didn't think it would work that well at all, but it did. Oh, but okay. I can enhance it like this. So if you pay attention to feedback, repeated feedback, not something that happens once or twice, but something that happens over and over and over again, now automatically, just by paying attention, observation alone, the feedback will tell you in a very obvious manner what kind of adjustment and modification you have to make to make your stuff better. So oh, that is creativity. Oh, I see. Because creativity is to bring something new into the equation. And what I just described is exactly that. I but see. it's a long process, right? I got you. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you mean by you stay in the moment, but then the testing moment demands is not, you to stay in right, the moment. It's not gonna, yeah. So you're not going to get the results that you expect. No. But if you're in the moment, mm -hmm. you could actually, you know, you could perceive the exact results that happen, and then you use your creativity to adjust it to what you need to do, right? Yeah, and okay. that is would be like that makes sense. That would be one example of creativity in the present. There's many examples, but this is a very common one that people can follow because it's used in sports science a lot. Whether it's football, soccer, baseball, MMA, Thai boxing, boxing, doesn't matter. Anytime that someone does something in the basics and get it ingrained, they're going to test it in the game in a non-cooperative manner right. through the feedback. A lot of coaches will film football games and then watch the film and then make adjustment and then change the drills for their players, right? So this happens in every sport. So this is a very good paradigm to illustrate how being in the present give you endless amount of creativity, not a little bit. So I, that's why I disagree that being in the present hamper your creativity process. But that's just one method. Another method could be, you know how a minute ago we talked about how you using cooperative training to ingrain the basics and then use non-cooperative testing for a feedback loop, right? Right. Yeah, but yeah. In between these two stages, there's something called semi-random, where A, B, and C, I know what's coming, and then A, B, and C, I don't know what's coming, but it's full contact, full pace, full speed, full power, really rough, right? Right. But in between those two stages would be like flow drill semi-random, where I don't know what's coming, but it's done playfully. It's not done where you're trying to take my head off. That's right. another way to do it, because when you do that, it's different than the first process that I described because you're no longer tapping into your reptilian brain, fight, flight, and freeze with adrenaline dump, where your survival instincts kicked in. Right. Because you're only attacking me with half speed, it's playful. Because it is playful, I'm not in survival mode. I'm not in fear mode, right? But because I'm in a playful mode, it taps into my intuition, which allows me to experiment in a way that I won't dare to experiment if it was if the risk was too high for me to screw around, right? Right, right. Under that playful condition, 
my creativity will skyrocket too. That's why in science, they're saying that the fastest way that a human can learn is through play. That's also how adult animals teach baby animals. If you look at um, lions or cheetahs or apes or uh, bears, right? By play fighting and not serious, they get in the experimental mode very quickly and very naturally. And the key word here is natural. Because mm -hmm. Mother Nature does that, if you look at animals. So when you're in a playful mood, you naturally get really creative in a playful, intuitive process. But there's a weakness to that. Don't and overdo it, right? Well, not that. It's because, because of this play, because it's not done with full speed and power, unlike the first process that we outlined, you, some things that might work during play won't work in real time, in real speed, in real power. But the first method also has a minus is where if you do it too much, you're tapping into your fight, flight, and freeze, is really bad for your psyche, right? If you take it to the extreme, few people will, but for those who have taken it to the extreme, can end up getting aggression displacement or get PTSD if, that, if done in a combative manner. Right. So that's why it's important to use all this stuff. You need cooperative training to ingrain the basics. You need semi-random flow training to tap into your intuitive creativeness and play. Right. And then you need your full non-cooperative realistic pace type of training and testing for reality. But all of them has to be keep in balance. Without the cooperative training, you never gave yourself a chance to ingrain skills in your nervous system. You haven't done the basics, right? So everything you do after that's gonna crumble because you don't have a foundation, right? Without the semi-random base and you do too much full non-cooperative testing, that's not good because because you, you always tap into your back brain, you're going to tax your adrenaline glands and you're going to tax your psyche too much. But if you don't have the full contact stuff and you only do the semi-random flow stuff, you lack reality base. Everything has a balance. That's why when people go around and they, they kind of insult people on what they specialize in. And I don't think it's ever good to disrespect someone's work because... They might see someone do cooperative training and they'll say something like, um, well, that's bullshit. Let me see you do that in a real fight, blah, blah, blah. Well, that guy, that's the same as seeing, seeing someone working on the guitar and the guy's learning the basic notes, which is a, hey, let's see you play a real song. Well, the guy's working on the basics. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. necessary part of the journey. Right. So, and the same thing a second. When you see people play, they'll go, hey, man, that's not realistic. Nobody will attack that slow. It's like, look, the guy's doing a drill because he already worked on the basic. He might have done full contact or full pressure testing the night before. Right now he's working on flow because maybe he's taking a break. Maybe he want to turn off his reptilian brain and turn on the part that's playful so he can create more variables. That's part of the process, right? Right. But same thing with someone that's doing full non-cooperative stuff. So everything, if you understand how your mind work, has its place. The right. trick is to know when to use what drill. But... The last two process of an intuitive, playful part and the full non-cooperative part, both of them rely on the present moment to trigger innate creativity. Right, right. So creativity can definitely be tapped into from a present moment point of view. And to enhance that, since in this podcast, we try our best to also make sure we talk about Qigong. When you're in the process of learning how to meditate, even at a low level, you're learning right away to get out of your head the thinking part, you're also learning how to turn off your reptilian brain and you're turning on the part of you that's really intuitive. They, I forgot which monk it was. I think it was from France and it was a Tibet Buddhist monk. But it puts brain scan tubes all over him to look at him in an MRI. Oh, yeah, I read brain about scan. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was pretty incredible because it showed that the part of the brain, the reptilian brain, that, that's responsible for anxiety, fear, rage, and all that, that part of the brain was super turned off, right? The gray matter was less... But the part of them that was more playful, compassionate, um, also short-term memory and intuition, creativity, oh, and positive emotions part of the brain, that part of the brain was light up like a Christmas tree. And the thinking cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for analyzation, doing math and stuff like that, that part of the brain was also kind of lower and turned off. So through brain scanning, they were able to show that. And he wasn't doing advanced meditation. He was demonstrating a basic uh, presence exercise. Mindful. Meditation. Yeah, right. mindfulness, meditation, right. that kind of stuff. The popular stuff. And even then, because he was at such a high level with so many decades of practice, it showed concretely, scientifically, through the brain scan, that what I just talked about is true. 
not to say that what I'm talking about is true, just common sense in the Qigong well, community. Yeah. Right, right. And so learning Qigong can actually enhance what we talked about with the martial art of being able to be in a present moment and therefore enhancing your creativity. Now, if you take that line of thinking to the farthest end, which is really, really rare, because most of the time when we talk about creativity, like up with the Qigong, we're talking about turning off the part of your brain that's thinking and turning off turning off the part of your brain that's very anxious, angry, fight, flight, or flight through relaxation. So you get more natural create, creative process. But it, that's almost like a byproduct. Does it make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, because you're meditating, so you're more relaxed. Therefore, when you play football or when you play martial arts or when you play badminton, whatever, automatically you're more creative because you're turning off the part of your brain that's tense and you're turning off the part of your brain that's thinking. Is that like... Yeah. What you describe when uh, when you get in the zone? Yeah, but that's a byproduct. It's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. But you get in the zone when you're when you're doing the thing, not when you're meditating, right? Meditating yeah. has the byproduct of getting creative because you're not trying to get creative when you meditate. You're no, that's why I mean it's a byproduct. Right, so you right. can be anything. You can be a computer code programmer. Yeah, yeah. You can be a Thai boxer. You can be a piano player. Studies and study have shown meditation actually increases creativity. So it's a supplement training. So here's the activity that you're in. It's some kind of sport, chess player, computer programmer, right. whatever. That's your activity. And then on this side, as a supplement training, you do meditation on the side, which scientifically has proven it turns off the thinking part of your brain and it turns off the anxious and angry part of your brain. So now you're more present, intuitive, and creative. So now when you go back to do your activity, because of your supplement training and meditation, you end up getting more creative results. When that is reported over and over again, they go, oh, meditation is good for creativity. But what I'm trying to tell you is, can you see how it's just supplement? It's like... um is a byproduct. Yeah, makes but sense. But I'm saying if you take this thinking at the farthest end of the spectrum, they're not two things. And of all the systems that I've seen in my life with my limited knowledge the last 38 years, I only saw it twice. So if you got like Tai Chi, if you look at martial art, we have Tai Chi, no, not Tai Chi, but sorry. You got Wing Chun, Long Fist, Hakka Fist, Hongar, Choli Fai, Boxing, Karate, all, all this martial art, right? Right. And then on this side, we, we call it internal martial art. We'll work, where basically historically, Tai Chi Bagu and Xing Yi, Lu Hi Bafa, they took pieces of Taoism, especially the Loi Gong part, I think. For those that's not clear about this, watch the last episode where we talk about this. Mm -hmm. They took a piece of it, the energetics part, right? The container part. And then they placed it upon fighting techniques and made up an internal martial art. That's cool. But what I'm saying is there's actually, of all this internal system that I've seen, there is two that I've seen in my life that these two things are connected, where the creative process of meditation and the activity were meant to be one. One of them was Sulam Logan Yatsisim. In English, that is, how do you translate that? Shellin internal one finger zen. So that's one system. The other system is when I was talking to Steve Smith and again watched the last episode when I talk about him, Heaven Mountain Qigong. I'm sure there's other systems that have done this, but those are the two systems that I've seen that specialize in Shen Chuan, which is, well, how do you translate that? Uh, spirit boxing. So basically you open up the container when you feel the stuff, the stuff intuitively teach you how to fight. So now the creative process in the Qigong is one thing. It is not two things. That would be a very similar to a uh, shaman animal dancing, where you embody the animal while you're in a trance dancing. I'm, I'm not going to go into this really deep because uh, it is much easier to learn this in person than trying to describe something that you're supposed to feel, right? So that's why when we do those workshops coming up or retreats, it'd be cool to work these things. But yeah. all around the globe, in all shaman cultures and in internal Qigong cultures, they will use embodiment as a major practice of embodying an archetype or an animal or an element. And then through that embodiment, things starts to come out. You see that a lot in method actors too. They embody a character and wow, it's like the energy is right in them and it's amazing to watch. Dancers yeah. are the same way. Well, I'm saying martial art actually has the same thing. But I only saw two systems out of the hundreds I've seen that it is directly one thing and not supplement. Because a lot of times you can train fighting techniques and train 
some kind of qigong meditation over here and then try to bridge them together you don't even have to try to bridge it just by doing qigong and meditation as a supplement mm -hmm. and by doing fighting over here naturally when you do fighting your creativity goes up just like if you play piano and you do meditation on the side when you play piano your creativity goes up right. and this is all reported all over the place right or if you play football and you do meditation your creativity goes up if you're a writer you do meditation but they're separate. The activity and the meditation are separate right. using a supplement training. I'm saying twice in history I've seen it happen in one activity with the heavy mountain qigong and the one finger zen tradition where the fighting and the qigong was embedded together since its infancy. Unlike tai chi, bagua, and xing yi where it was separate and someone took it and planted it in. Because if you look at Chen style tai chi, for example, if you look at the oldest form, I would say 90% of the technique is actually Shaolin long fist. So there's no brainer that somebody took Shell and Long Fist, grabbed Taoist Qigong and plugged it in and then developed something really beautiful and awesome, right? Right. Same with Xing Yi. If you look at the techniques of Xing Yi, they exist in many, many Kung Fu style. What separate them is this power generation from post training. So somebody took Taoist post training and plugged it in Kung Fu techniques. But with the Heaven Mountain and also with the One Finger Zen, directly embodiment was part of his practice. So that tells me the roots of that was probably shamanistic. I can't think of any other explanation. I could be wrong though, but it's very shamanistic. Like the embodiment practice was right in there from the day one, right? And it is amazing to watch. So is it, yeah. um, <clears throat> Is it like they, they were doing all the meditation and then that's how they developed the system? Or did they develop the system first? There's no way to know, eh? Well, 7,000 years old. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some say 5,000, but anything past 1,000 is like, yeah. how are you gonna, how are you gonna find out, right? Right. So, um, any other questions? Yeah, well, um, no, <clears throat> that one, yeah, yeah. We'll covered that one. Okay, so, uh, Let's yeah. continue with one more question. Yes, sir. This one Go comes from uh, Jose, Jose Garcia. Jose, how you doing, Jose? All right. So Jose wants to know about sleeping Qigong. Sleeping Qigong. Oh. I got no, I got to admit, I, got, I, I want to know about that too, because, you know, <laughs> some days, you know. Yeah, cool. there's, there's four pillars of practice pretty much in most style of complete Qigong. That is lying down, sitting, standing, moving, right? right. A complete system should have all four. That way, when you're, anytime you are 24 hours a day, you're practicing. Because, you know, 24 hours a day, we're either sitting, standing, moving, or laying down, right? So sleeping is one of them, laying down. And, uh, well, there's many ways to do it. Uh, how about I talk about four systems really briefly? Okay. Or four exercises. So one of them is like scanning, right? We talked a little bit about that uh, last episode. So you scan the lines and you melt them to the bed. I'm not going to go over the scanning because I talked about it last episode or the episode before. Yeah, so yeah. that's a nice little warm-up. All the blood goes into the toes eventually, and it goes into the bed. Now you feel like you're melting into the bed, and you can feel the heat going down into your toes when you're scanned properly. The blood is going to your digestive system. So right away, you're out of your head, so you stop thinking, which is a major cause when your cortisol is too high and you're overthinking. So people get insomnia, they can't sleep. They have to get up and check their email, check their phone, because their brain's... Right? Yeah, yeah. So just by scanning alone, you, get, you fall asleep faster and you get way better quality of sleep because you're relaxing before you sleep. Sleeping Qigong is really important because when you're sleeping, when you're about to fall asleep and when you actually fall asleep, it's when your short-term memory gets transferred to your long-term memories. So it's good to clean out the garbage before that happens. You don't want to transfer and store all this bad stuff in your psyche. All these bad memories you don't want, right? All this yeah. trauma you don't want, all this stress you don't want. Clean out the trash before you go to sleep so only good stuff gets transferred. I can't emphasize that enough. Because a lot of students are like, you know, hey, I get really good sleep. I don't need qi sleeping Qigong. Well, that's not really the main purpose of it. Oh. Right? From a... Uh, basic point of view the first thing is you want to clean out your mind so when that gets transferred every single night you transfer good stuff you throw away the bad stuff i thought that was an automatic process that our brains do anyways no that's what i'm saying it's an automatic thing our brains do but what is not automatic is you're not just transferring the good stuff if you don't clean it out first you're transferring good and bad right Oh, the I brain see. doesn't make a difference. So you want to release all the tension with all the memories, all that stuff. You want to release that stuff, all the negativity before you fall asleep. So now you don't have bad stuff. You get the good stuff. Oh, that makes it's, yeah. Well, it's okay. called clearing the dust for a fancy term in Taoism. Right? So you clean off the dust. 
you know, all that anger you experienced today. Maybe you had a bad day at work, maybe whatever. So you want to, the scanning is good for that. One way that you can do it. Okay. So once you have that, another thing you can do, like in each one, we have that sitting, I mean the sitting, the, the sitting kind of sitting, you're leaning back like this. Right? Then the next one is you're laying down fully. So it's the same thing as we learn in basic post training where you elongate the joints, right? You elongate the tailbone and the disc in between. That's really important. You get good alignment. Everything's relaxed, just like scanning and it's starting to fall down. Once you can do that, if you keep on practicing, then you can start working on inflating, like you're opening up the space in the fascia and the internal organs, especially in the rib area and also the legs. If you keep practicing, you can open up your pores and pore breathing. So you can open up your pores, but it's really your um, imagination. It's not real. But if you keep practicing, you start getting a sense that it is real. So to check that, you open the window. If, if you feel chills going right in your bones, your pores are open. Now it's real. So that's what I mean by not BSing yourself, right? Once you get to that point, then poor breathing will naturally happen. If you keep practicing, bone breathing will naturally happen. If you keep practicing, you start sensing your feel. Each one kind of stops there, right, for most people. Right. So if you have that ingrained and built up pretty good in the daytime, especially through post-training, then when you sleep, you do the exact same process. Just but if, down. Yeah, everything I just said. But if you taught someone sleeping qigong from an each one point of view, they won't get anything I'm saying that fast. They'll probably fall asleep way before any of those things happen. Be so, honest, I tried it and I fell asleep exactly, way right? before. <laughs> <laughs> so without the post-training, you can't transfer it. Got it. Simply because we have a tendency to fall asleep when we relax. Right. So in the daytime, through proper post-training, you want to build all these elements I'm talking about, right. which would take a few years. But even the most basic one, lining up and elongating the bones and having punging, even that, you can translate that nicely into sleep. And what I notice is when people that do that, if they do it too well, they actually can't fall asleep. They feel like a battery being charged, like, holy cow. It's kind of like when you do posturing properly, you feel really strong, but really relaxed. So now you're not in a sleeping mood at all, <laughs> right? So the irony, yeah. you want to you wanna get like the happy medium, right? You don't want to charge yourself too much, you know? But it's both of those methods I just talked about, the scanning and the each one, will clean out all the, all the dust, right? Like if you're feeling angry, you start to feel not angry. If you're feeling scared, you won't be scared. Anxiety, stress, all that. You start to feel very calm. Usually most people get a little bit of an endorphin rush. So you start to feel that peace and happiness. That's a good place to be when you're falling asleep. It stops nightmares. You stop translating when your memory goes from your short term to long term. You start um, tra transferring all the bad stuff, right? But a more advanced version would be... Um, the One Finger Zen we're talking about, Heaven Mountain and uh, Lord Don also do this. So many systems do this where you're not doing anything that I talked about previously, but building the container with the each one. Instead, you're directly only working with the feel. What that does is it triggers dream, dreams. You start getting pretty whacked dreams. I'm mm. not going to really talk about what kind of dreams you get, but it, it, it's pretty cool. They're teaching dreams. Like uh, vivid sort of... Well, know you're awake type of know you're dreaming type of dream or well at first you just get really wacky dreams <laughs> like you're like i never get dreams like this oh yeah <laughs> um when you start working the field then the second thing is that it becomes very lucid Ooh, yeah, like yeah. after a year or so you start getting lucid dreams and then after a year or so you can you start to realize you're in a dream when you're in a dream so all this stuff, and there's drills you can do for this, but maybe another day we can talk about it. I hate talking about things that I can't prove on a spot, right? So that's why. But mm -hmm. it's better to do this again. Like maybe after this podcast, I'll show it to you. Then you can experiment with it tonight right away, right? Then you can call me. So that that's more productive than just talking about a bunch of stuff that it's not right. concrete. I'd rather right. it to be concrete for you, right? right. So when you do... I'm not, out of the four things, the moving, standing, sitting, and lying, the worst I'm at is the lying down qigong because I have a tendency to just fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. But what I do notice even at my low level, I'm not very good at it, at the dreaming stage, right, is that, like, I wake up with pretty high cortisol. That's how we wake up as humans, by the way. Your cortisol wakes you up. That's oh. why you don't sleep forever. So usually when you wake up, you start, hey, I got to check my email. Oh, boy, I got to do that. You get in this antsy, anxious, stressed out mode for most people. Rushing through the door, I'm late for work, all that stuff, right? 
And I used to be like that for decades. But what I noticed after I started sleeping with Qigong is if I sleep six hours, it felt like I slept for eight or nine. Like I feel refreshed. Oh. That means I wasn't stressed out when I was sleeping. And number two, what I notice is when I wake up, I don't have that rush anymore. I just take my time. Oh, I'm late for work. I'm late for work. <laughs> like, I get this super, like my cortisol level is high enough to wake me up, but it doesn't spike anymore. Ah. It's just enough to wake you up. And then it goes, then it turns off. I didn't know that because I didn't read about this in any of the Qigong books. But through practice, I go, oh, that's actually one of the, even if it's such a low level benefit, it really, really benefit me because I used to hate, I'm not a morning person, right? Now I am simply because, oh, waking up feels great. There's no spike of cortisol, nothing. I don't feel groggy. I don't feel like I get good quality sleep. So sipping Qigong is something I encourage everybody to do. Um, again, there's many, many styles, but you want to put it in categories. Is it just simply relaxation techniques? Most styles starts there. Is it just building the container? That's more like internal martial art type of thing. Or does it go farther than internal martial art? Now you're hitting the working with dreams in the field, right? Which is more the Taoism stuff or any shamanistic study. So when you work with these layers, um, for me, the, it's to make a life better. So when you wake up, you go, huh. Or another thing it does is, is you get this little message. Like you get this problem, right? It's famous for college students anyways before. You get this problem and you, you ask the question. And when you wake up, the solution is there. That oh, yeah, I heard about it. Your subconscious you, right? works it out. No, too. but have you ever experienced that? Mm, I can't You're remember. You're thinking about Maybe something. Maybe I have, you, yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people experience that once in a while. So it's, mm. like a, it's like a deja vu. Once in a while, you get that. I right? actually get that during yeah. the day sometimes where I just work on a problem and then... I just stop and say, I'm not going to work on it anymore. And your subconscious yeah. is... And then I'll go and make yeah. a coffee a couple hours later, and then the solution just comes. Yeah. So, so if the, with the sleeping chicken, why I notice is that happens a lot more. Say if it happens once a year, it starts to happen, I don't know, 30 times a year. Like That's starting to spike a little bit, which I really enjoy, because now I don't have to think about stuff as much. So, yeah. um, so as it is, I fall asleep way before... <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> and you too. But you you said that if you do the standing yeah. post, uh, you know, the post standing, it'll decrease the amount of time for you when you're in bed to try to align your bones and do all the breathing. Like Not only that time it, will get shorter, and then it's instantaneous. So hopefully you won't fall asleep before you get to that state, right? Yeah. Well, you don't. It's, it's instantaneous. Oh, it just happens. Oh. Because you um, already built the feeling in your nervous system. You just got to anchor it, switch it on, it's there. But if you haven't built it before, good luck doing it laying down. You'll fall asleep way before. Yeah, that. yeah. Because it might take you an... Like, most people to get into a meditative state, and the most basic idea is when your mind shuts up, 45 minutes to an hour for most people. But if you meditate a lot, it literally takes you five seconds, right? Because you already built that muscle, so to speak. Mm. So your brain's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets, right? Right. So if you built all this stuff in post training, when you do laying down qigong, it's instantaneous. But if you haven't done post training, and I see my teacher try to teach some of his uh, cancer patients how to do sitting, laying down qigong, they just fall asleep. Oh yeah. But they he wakes them up and make them keep on going because they're in a lot of pain. So they needed to learn some of that for pain management. But um, for a normal person, that's not that sick. It's like, why don't you just push What would you say is like, it's basically not possible to do sleeping Qigong without... Oh, I'll never use the word impossible. But for the people that I've seen in my lifetime. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe there's someone out there that so can I would, do it. Yeah. I always thought I was doing something sort of similar to that. Like, for me, when, uh, when, I was, when I'm not able to sleep and I'll mm -hmm. just lay down, I'll just stop trying to think about stuff and I just count. Breathe in one, breathe out two. Yeah. Breathing three, breathe out four, yeah. and then yeah, I never get I never get to fifty. <laughs> and moment me gone. But that, that would be yeah. an example of the first layer: relaxation techniques. So that's oh, okay. cutting breath is very um, very common. But when you're waking up, have you noticed that right between sleep and you're fully awake, there's that vague point? Yeah. Ever get aware of that in the morning? Yeah. That's usually when your thoughts are being generated. Like by generated, I mean it bubbles to the point where you're conscious of it. And you start going, hey, I have to drive beyond to the school. Yeah, I yeah, better yeah. go grocery shopping today. So all these thoughts usually bubbles between sleeping and fully waking up. That bubble stage, right? Yeah. And for most of us, it's highly subconscious. So by the time it boils, when you're fully awake and your cortisol wakes you up, you're in that rush mode I'm talking about. Right. 
What I noticed if you do a lot of sleeping qigong is you're dead asleep, but when you're in between sleep and awake with that bubbly point where the thoughts are generated, you'll catch it. It's weird. Like you just go, oh, I'm doing that. And then you can turn off the bubbles. Oh. But you're not consciously going to stop. It just stops itself. Like as soon as you're aware of something stupid, you stop doing it. So yeah. your brain goes, oh, we're being stupid. So it goes. <laughs> and then when you wake up, you're just like, oh, I'm awake. I'm going get. And then just nothing bothers you for a while. It's really weird. So I, I think that's something that is, uh, it's easy to learn too, laying down Qigong. I think people should, hard part is getting people to practice it. That, that, and that's, staying awake, right? Yeah, like every night. <laughs> can you do it every night? Well, I'll do it once in a while. But then you're not going to get anything out of it, right? Right. So you gotta, it's got to be a habit, just like uh, eating, showering, walking. It's just, yeah. Everything turn it into Qigong. There's eating. It just becomes part of your daily routine. Yeah, that was eating, that was showering, that was sleeping. The Davos guys made everything that you do into a practice for a reason. So you never turn off. They said you're supposed to practice 24 hours a day. And then people frame it like, what do you mean? I got to meditate 20? No, 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 no. You just, they've come up with ways to practice for every basic human endeavor. Fighting, showering, walking, sitting, standing, moving, sleeping, having sex, cooking food. The Taoists got many, many, many drills for a reason. So you never turn off. You're always in that mode. Because if you only meditate two hours a day, that's how good you get. But if you meditate 24 hours a day, what happens? You get a little bit better, right? Yeah, Than yeah. the other guys. So, of course. They thought about this quite a bit. Oh, yeah, guys. Um, we're very flattered since this podcast came out in the last few Kung Fu reports. Chris has been telling me there's a lot of requests and emails about how can you learn this. And I've already said in the last few episodes and also in my articles and ebooks that you, I recommend it quite a few teachers. But you're still asking, you know, and I feel flattered you're asking if you can train this with me. So we are going to be doing a workshop retreat seminar whatever you want to call it we don't know when and where yet we're going to be planning it so go to the description of this video and chris will put a link below on where you can look at our live events and you can go in there and give us your feedback basically we try to get more feedback of where people want this to happen when to happen and we might be able to make it happen yeah all right if yeah. anything, you could also just go to the website and there's right yeah. on the homepage. There's a button there. Amchankungfu.com. And then you can put a description below. Yeah. All right, guys. See you next time. See you next time. Have guys. a good night. Okay.